please welcome the Executive Director of Future Earth, Dr. Amy Lures. Good afternoon, everybody. We are here today because of the story told in this one graphic. This figure, known as the hockey stick, shows that the Earth's surface temperatures have skyrocketed over the last 100 years. This is a fact that's been documented by the scientific community and is increasingly being felt by each one of us in this room in our daily lives. What we know as we look into the future, as the temperatures continue to rise, it will affect every aspect of our life. It will affect the water we drink, the food we eat, the businesses we run. Fortunately, in 2015, the world came together and committed to work together to tackle this crisis and avoid the most, severest, most severe impacts. And we keep global warming pollution down sufficiently enough to avoid a two degree rise in global temperatures. This will not be an easy task. This will require a complete global transformation of the global economic system. But we are already experiencing a global economic tra transformation, driven largely by a second hockey curve, one that tells the story of the rise of innovation, the rise of technology that in recent years is driven by the, rise, the transformations in information and communication technologies. Over the last decade, the increasing use of cell phones, compute capacity, earth observation, machine learning, and so much more are transforming how we're governing our society, how we're running our businesses, how we're interacting with the environment. The question remains, however, is will this global economic transformation guide us, steer society towards a low carbon and climate resilient society? We do know that ICT, information and communication technologies, have a huge role to play in tackling the crisis. And we'll hear some entrepreneurs talking about how they're innovating in this space in a conversation later in this session led by Christiana Figueres. But before we go into that, I wanted to take a moment to provide a little bit more context to the challenge ahead. Earlier today, Future Earth, the organization that I lead, which is a global network of entrepreneurs and researchers working together to accelerate transformations to global sustainability. Future Earth, together with Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund, WWF, Ericsson, Stockholm Resilience Center, and many others, released a roadmap for exponential action on climate. This roadmap shows that we need to reduce emissions, half emissions every decade, to get us on track to keep to, to, keep to the Paris Agreement goals. And in this roadmap, there are three different key parts of working together. One is stronger climate leadership, one is stronger climate policy, and one is deeper engagement with the ICT sector. The ICT sector has a huge role to play in terms of increasing resource efficiency across the reductions in all these different sectors, and also in terms of innovating action moving forward. Of course, if this industry is going to play a critical role, it needs to make sure that its carbon footprint is moves to zero. Fortunately, the data suggests that there is a trend towards leveling off and potentially peaking in the emissions of this sector. We will hear later, momentarily, from Lisa Jackson, who's leading work at Apple, that demonstrates that companies can move towards a carbon neutral economy. But the real impact of the ICT sector in terms of driving action and tackle, helping us tackle this crisis may not be in the reduction of their footprint alone, although that's vitally important. It might be in, more in, in the ability of their, to turn their entrepreneurial power to work together with scientists, policymakers, and climate leaders to develop new business models and new climate policy approaches to drive climate action, and to leverage their influence on the consumers and producers, billions of consumer and producer productions in the world, 
every day. This roadmap that we released today highlights the essential role of the ICT sector in climate action. But they can't do it alone. We need to work together, policy, science, climate leaders, and the, this industry. We hope that the launch of this roadmap will help to open up new roads of collaboration. And with that, I want to hand it over to Lisa Jackson, who will be telling us about the exponential work that she's leading at Apple. Thank you. Got to hand her that iPhone. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. It's so wonderful to be here with so many people who know how important it is to protect our planet and who are on the cutting edge of bravery and strength and intellect in doing so. Uh, during the course of my career, I'm now able to say that, <laughs> um, I've worn two different hats pursuing the same goal that you are. One is that of a policymaker. As head of the EPA under President Obama, I saw firsthand how the policies that we develop and enact can push the needle from an at-risk future to a hopeful one. But the other hat, which is where I'm going to spend my time today, is the hat I wear right now, which is that of a business executive. In that role, I get to see how essential major companies are in building the clean energy economy that we need, and how these companies benefit from the certainty that comes from everyone working together toward that goal. It's a thrill to see so many people here who represent both sides of that equation. The air we breathe and the planet we leave to our children does not belong to any individual ideology. It belongs to each of us, to everyone. And the US government, no matter which political party leads it, should be our ally in the work ahead. Just a few weeks ago, the administration announced that they plan to roll back nationwide clean energy standards. The new plan risks drastically increasing emissions over the next 20 years. It risks risk harming the real economic potential we're seeing every day in clean energy technology. And it's come amid other rollbacks of environmental protections and safeguards that were put into place just a few short years ago and that we're just beginning to demonstrate some of the potential of real results that we knew would, would happen. So the underlying message seems to be that protecting the environment is somehow bad for business. Well, let me take my policy hat off for a second and put that business hat on again. As head of environmental initiatives at Apple, I've had a front row seat to the tremendous impact that progressive environmental policy can have on profits and productivity. And I am here today to tell you unequivocally, unequivocally, and, uh -oh, unequivocally <laughs> that there is no conflict between a healthy planet and a healthy bottom line. It's a false choice and it's one we must reject. And you don't have to take my word for it, just consider Apple's own record. Over the last two years, we've issued $2.5 billion in green bonds, the largest ever from a U.S. corporation, to demonstrate how businesses can help drive the reduction of global emissions. Today, nearly $2 billion of those funds have been put to work on big projects yielding big results. One of the most historic of those came in April when we announced that every one of our global facilities now run on 100% clean energy. That means every store, every data center, every corporate office, and every co-located facility around the world, it's an accomplishment that we are extremely proud of. We've also made, thank, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, that's nice. We've also made major progress toward a longer running and much more challenging goal, which is powering our entire global supply chain on entirely clean energy. Today, 23 of our global suppliers of all sizes have joined in this pledge, but we understand that that's not easy to do everywhere. So this summer, we launched a $300 million clean energy fund in China to keep the momentum going. It's a first of a kind program to help businesses tap into renewable energy, especially in places where those energy sources can be tricky to find. We hope it's a model that could be replicated around the world. 
We're also protecting or creating enough sustainably managed working forests to cover all of our product packaging. And 100% of the paper we use in our product packaging is responsibly sourced or recycled. While we've committed to protecting working forests as a source of environmentally friendly material, we also know that forests play an essential role in the fight against climate change. I'm proud to announce today that we've partnered with Conservation International to establish an 11,000 hectare mangrove forest project on the Caribbean coast of Colombia. These, these forests are critical because they're one of nature's most important tools in the battle against climate change. They can absorb and store up to 10 times more carbon than a terrestrial forest. I was speaking to Sanjay this morning you know, his blue carbon work is so incredibly important and a vital link to communities that rely on the health of that ecosystem. The project, this project alone is expected to generate an estimated one million tons of emission reductions over its lifetime. And in its first two years, the project aims to reduce carbon emissions by 17,000 metric tons, which is equivalent to the emissions produced by the vehicles that update Apple, Apple Maps over the next decade. So that makes that program carbon neutral. Globally, we've lost half of the world's mangrove forests since the 1940s. So it's high time we start preserving and protecting them. We're also constantly looking for ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from manufacturing, even down to reimagining centuries old processes. We recently partnered with Alcoa Corporation, Rio Tinto Aluminum, and the governments of Canada and Quebec to bring a revolutionary new method of direct emissionless, emissions free aluminum smelting to commercial use. Think about that. One of the most essential industrial processes releasing oxygen instead of carbon dioxide direct emissions. It's just one more way that we're investing in transformative and valuable innovation. I'm really proud of how far we've come in just over a decade when Apple started assessing its greenhouse gas emissions and assessing those emissions associated with every product that we ship and launching initiatives to reduce them. Something else happened, by the way, as we were focusing on reducing our environmental impact. You probably didn't notice it, but it goes back to that false choice that I mentioned earlier. Over the last decade, Apple became the most valuable company in the world. I don't say that to brag, maybe not entirely. I say it because it reinforces a point that has guided my time, not just at Apple, but my entire career, and really the last half century of environmental protection in the US and around the world. And that point is this, with the right dedication and with innovation, we can protect the planet while remaining highly profitable. We're proud that we've taken many of these steps toward environmental sustainability during some of the most successful quarters in Apple's history. These efforts are a complement to and a component of our success, and we want to help our peers in the corporate world do the same. After all, this is a model that's not just working for us. You saw the data. A 2017 study found that the American renewable energy industry is generating jobs 12 times faster than the rest of the economy. Green technology is still a generational opportunity to do well by doing good, and the risks of missing it are real. In economic potential left on the table, in public health harms left unaddressed, in environmental disasters that will continue to mount. At Apple, we are big believers in the idea that there's no problem too big or too complex to solve through creativity, collaboration, and innovation. And that pessimism and doomsaying can only stand in the way of possibility and opportunity. From the standpoint of any business, from the standpoint of any person, from my standpoint as a mother of two sons who are inheriting this world that we leave them, we have to act. And as our CEO, Tim Cook, de declared last June, when the federal government made plans to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, Apple is committed to fight climate change and we will never waver. I am fiercely proud to be part of a company whose mission includes protecting and preserving our planet. I'm honored to be working with you alongside each and every one of you in reaching that goal. And I'm confident that together we will pass on a brighter and more beautiful world for sons and daughters. Thanks so much.
Hello, everyone. I'm Cristiana Figueres, and I want to be joined by my fantastic panel. Please come up. Suzanne from Salesforce, Rashmanan from Tech Mahindra, Miguel from WeWork, and Ryan from Jump and Uber. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so I think the video has already spilled the beans, but I think actually that Mark Benioff already spilled the beans. Thank you, Mark. Fantastic job uh, today by saying that it is really quite exciting that we have a coalition of 21 companies who have come together not to coordinate their products and services, not to interfere with each other's business plans, but actually to just join in achieving the goal which is to get us quicker to net zero emissions by, uh, by 2050, each of you from a very different uh, and unique perspective uh, from your companies. And so these are 21 companies, the names that you've just seen. And uh, today we're joined by four uh, of these companies. So dear friends, this morning, if you weren't there, the whole topic this morning that was introduced was about how, I didn't say this on stage, but this is the way my daughters would put it, incremental uh, and linear progress is so five minutes ago. Uh, and we just have to you know, let go of that mindset and change our chip and get into the exponential mindset because for, for the simple reason that A, the threats of climate change are growing exponentially and otherwise look at the hurricane that is threatening. Um, and also because we're in that fantastic moment of history in which we have this, as you called it, the overlay of technology that pervades all sectors without which we would not even be able to aspire to go exponential on addressing climate change. But because we are in the year 2018, because the tech, the tech tentacles, if I may say, have reached into every corner of every single sector, we can actually aspire and should commit to going completely exponential. So I wanted to invite each of you to speak from your own experience and share with us your sense of um, A, how have you done on, and I'm gonna start with you, Suzanne, if that's okay, um, because you were the first to join the, um, the tech declaration, and you were so fantastic, you and your team, and I hope Patrick is somewhere in here. Yay, Patrick, uh, to really do a lot of heavy lifting to invite so many other companies to join this effort. But I would love to hear from you, Suzanne. Um, A, your commitments to emission reduction, but, which is great and not enough. Uh, your commitments to emission reductions from your supply chain, which is great and not enough. <laughs> um, and also, how are you going to use your products and your services coming from the customer relations sector that you do how, how can you use your products and services to help all other sectors, and you have your tentacles into many different sectors, to understand, change the, the, the mindset so that everyone can actually pursue the exponential growth of their companies, but also the attendant exponential growth in emission reductions that we need. Amen. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so first, I just want to say thank you. Um, you're just an incredible leader and have been for so many years, and it, it's such an honor to work with you. And we've come a long way from New Orleans, which is um, where we first took this commitment, really. And um, so, so mostly I just wanna say thank you. It's, it's really been an, our honor to help spearhead it with you. And you're right, I, I just have a fantastic team. So, um, and 21 companies is not enough, right. 21,000 yeah. is not enough. Okay, that's 20, great. you know, let's get up to 21 million and I think, you know, we'll then be we're happy. Getting close. <laughs> then we're getting closer. Uh, so if I just focus on um, the sort of why and, and the how of what we've done and just try to make it practical so that other people that are here can figure out, you know, what could I do in my company? What can I take away? How can I take action? We're all about action. Um, we really focused on three areas, as you mentioned. So, um, and the first 
was a real estate. So if anybody saw our CEO, uh, Mark Benioff, this morning, he started with a uh, film of the tower, which you can't miss here in San Francisco. Um, it is a giant. The tallest thing ever. Ever. <laughs> West of Chicago. Uh, and uh, we were incredibly thoughtful, thanks to a great real estate team and how that building was built. And we don't own the building. Um, so many people are tenants um, and they have to work with their landlords just like we do. Um, and we were able to still work closely enough in partnership with them to be able to put in the largest commercial black water system in North America, to have uh, you know the highest lead rating, on and on and on. Um, so even when you don't think you have power, you have power. That's the first thing, is our real estate. The second was our supply chain. Sorry, your real estate, but you're bringing all of those other companies that are also in that bingling along with you. That's right. And we thought about charging them, actually, for a good idea. <laughs> for a percentage of the installation of the Blackwater system, an example. And then we thought, unnecessary. Um, we will do it on behalf of the people that are going to be living and working with us every day. Um, and so when you think you don't have control, you often, there are things that you can control um, as it relates to climate action. The second is supply chain. And whether you have a small supply chain or you have a massive supply chain like a Unilever um, or a medium supply chain like a Salesforce or an ecosystem of any sort, uh, you can bring that ecosystem along with you to your point about uh, the other people in the building, right? You can bring your ecosystem along with you. It's not enough um, to require science-based targets from 50% of our companies in a few years. We want 100% of them. We want it faster. Um, and we have to start somewhere. And then really the third is science-based targets, which if you, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So you were really inspirational in helping us announce that we were one of the first companies to renounce that we would get to 100% renewable. We've accelerated. We accelerated uh, our net zero commitment by 33 years, which I'm incredibly proud of. Um, we've accelerated our all renewable uh, up to 2022. And in your exponential um, question, I was like, faster, why can't we just do it tomorrow? Uh, and what I learned through this process is that doing it smart is more important. And so we really had to focus on regions that needed um, a focus on a, on a clean grid and investing in VPPAs there and, and solar and different places that would, that would take time. So um, this is something that every company can do. We have playbooks that we're um, beginning to push out because we just think that collaboration is critical, transparency is critical. And the last point around technology, if you get a chance to stop by the, the giant Salesforce uh, booth down below, you'll see uh, we're, we're able to manage and measure all of our carbon footprint on our app. Uh, we will be launching an app um, in the next few months that will be um, for free for the public. Um, and we're kind of working on the plan on that for now. And What's lastly, the app do? well, if you look today, you'll see the We Mean Business app. Anybody could download that today. So you go to the App Store, download Salesforce Analytics. If you're a We Mean Business company, you can see how you compare to all the other We Mean Business companies. And we just launched that yesterday. Um, the app that we're working on will be uh, available to our customers and to the general public, but it will enable the ability to measure your carbon footprint and make it transparent. Again, transparency is critical. So thank you. Good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Suzanne. Dr. Brand, if I could um, move over to you, because um, we're all standing a little bit um, not really knowing, is artificial intelligence uh, going to be with us or going to be against us? And I think there are so many, um, so many arguments for the benefits of AI, but also so much concern about it. And so I just wanted to ask you, because I know that you are um, really um, using AI, in fact, even launching a competition. I, I wanted to give you the opportunity to explain to us how you see, A, what the competition is about, but also how do you see AI contributing beneficially to, um, certainly to emissions reductions, but frankly, to quality of life on this planet. And Christina, thank you, and thank you for getting my first name right so well. You made my day. Does that not occur very often? 
<laughs> you, you did very well. Thank you. So um, we're thrilled to be announcing AI for Action today as, as a step of commitment uh, from Tech Mahindra in collaboration with uh, GCAS. And uh, you know, I just wanted to talk to you about the genesis of how AI for Action came about. It wasn't sudden. Uh, it came through some experiences we had. The first one was in a smart city project we did in a place called Jabalpur in India. The smart sensors installed on waste bins. The sensors sent information to a central dashboard indicating when they were full. As a result of which the city was able to plan the pickups in a fuel efficient manner. The second was... Translation, reduction of emissions. Yeah, reduction of emissions. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> and uh, the second thing was the, the waste, the physical waste was converted into 11 and a half watts of energy, which powered 18,000 homes. The second example is in North America, lest we think that you know, developing countries and developed countries are different now. This is for an aircraft manufacturer, and we designed what's called an aircraft health monitoring system. As you're aware, aircrafts are designed for optimal energy usage, but degradation happens. So the systems we put in play identify a degradation, and when degradation happens, incidentally, fuel consumption goes up. So we are able to identify as a degradation is beginning to appear, mm -hmm. provide intervention services so that you reduce fuel leakage, number one. Number two, we are also able to identify when a part is going to go wrong beforehand and ensure that we provide intervention services. Again, this means that we are lengthening the life of a part and the carbon footprint that goes, that, that you save because you lengthen the part. And the second, this is the carbon footprint you save because of disposing of an old part, right? So we looked at both this and we said we had three learnings from this. Using artificial intelligence and digital technologies, you can mount a proof of concept at a low cost and very fast. Gone are those days when they built a Taj Mahal for 400 million and then wrote the whole thing off, right? And the second thing we realized is, this is like playing American football. You know, one individual or one organization just can't do it. You've got to partner with others. You have to realize you know, what, what, are the, what are your weaknesses and strengths, and how do you bring all, the, all these people together under one roof to be able to reach the destination. So we collaborated extensively with schools and universities. And many times we co-innovated with our customers. And the third thing we realize is there's a lot of cross-learning amongst these technologies. You implement something for an aerospace. The second solution is for farming. Even though the use case is specific to a particular area, it's like old wine. It gets richer as it ages, and there's lots of things that you can share. So we said we're thrilled. And then we were talking about the summit here, and we said, what can we do to create exponential growth happen? And that thought process you know, is what resulted in the AI for Action initiative. How can we encourage? So what, in essence, is it? It is leveraging AI and digital technologies to come up with solutions that can combat climate change. That is the concept. And who would be participating? Schools, universities, corporates, anybody who's willing to join this battle. How are we going to do it? We have a platform called Acumos. It was you know, built in collaboration with AT&T and uh, with the Linux Foundation. This is a marketplace for AI machine learning. We are going to create a specific instance for this step of challenge, which will be open to the community here. And individuals, corporates, whoever is interested would put in entries to participate in this competition. We are initially going to do it in four cities, San Francisco, New York, London, and New Delhi. Open the gates and get people to put in these entries, and the winners will be selected through a panel. Each regional winner would get 
a check of fifteen thousand dollars, and the and the and the winner who wins globally will will get hundred thousand dollars. So that's the plan. And there's a saying in my mother tongue Tamil. It goes like Sirithuli Peruvellam. What it means is it's small droplets of water that can create or make big flood happen. And so how can you participate? You know, all of you on this panel, you know, all of you here, all of you can participate because when when schools and universities come in and they have a bright idea, they need mentorship. You can participate as regional partners, global partners, and we can all come together and, uh, and solve what's in Christina's mind is how do you make this exponential? You just set this on fire. It's not at one point in time, only large corporations could do it. And that slowed things down. Today we have the cloud and the small corporation has access to the same kind of infrastructure. You can put it in all of us. In fact, squirrels can dance faster than elephants. <laughs> I really mean it. Thank you. <laughs> well, how, how, how wonderful. And I, I think what we have learned about this kind of competition in the past um, is that it's wonderful if you have a few winners at the end, but that's not the whole point. The point is to give the incentive and Everyone who participates has actually already benefited just by having been given the challenge of think about this, right? Think about this. And, you know, independently of how much money they get at the end, every single bit of that counts because, as we know, how many startups have started in back garages with $2 in their, in their pockets uh, and have become huge companies? So thank you very much for that. That's very this fun. This is one competition where everyone is a winner. Yes, true. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Fantastic. Very good. Um, so, Miguel, I also wanted to um, ask you, because actually both you and Ryan are in companies uh, that have totally disrupted the sector in which you're in, uh, which is... Fantastic. Uh, and the question, however, is how do you see uh, you've disrupted the real estate or the office space sector? Did you know that it was going to be exponential when you started? When did you know that it became exponential? How are you dealing with exponential growth? Um, and of course, from our perspective, how is that actually helping? exponential emission reduction? Yeah, it's an interesting question to think about what do you know when you're in it, when you're right in the middle of the process versus what can you claim that you knew um, looking back, you know? So I, I like to um, imagine that our ambition at the time, you know, going back to 2010, um, matches what we've accomplished, because that shows our amazing uh, vision and foresight. Um, but at the same time, there's no way, like, you know, WeWork buildings are opening at a rate of 30 to 40 per month um, around the world. I mean, literally in every continent um, except Africa. Uh, and that would have been impossible to imagine. So where we could have, you know, had the piece of paper and thought, okay, yeah, we can draw a dot on a map and say we want to be in Jakarta or Tokyo or Shanghai one day. Um, how that would happen, what it would take to make it happen, what it would feel like when you walk into a WeWork location um, in one of those places, it, you know, that was beyond um, our capability of seeing. And I think what we're excited about is we're in that same stage now in terms of impact. You know, we're like we can now look back and say, what were the why were we different in the way we thought about, you know, building buildings? How did we create velocity and speed and execution in such a way that was different than the world had ever seen before? How can we apply that same thinking to the impact and the, um, you know, one example, we, we were doing some early calculations and they could be way off, but our early calculation was that our electric bill, if we're buying it in the way that we do now, in five years would be somewhere 600 or $700 million a year. And you know, that's a lot, <laughs> that's, a big, that's a big bill. Um, but 
being able to see that for the first time and think, well, okay, if we can think about that now and trying to address that um, with with smart solutions in interesting ways that are both you know built in the most efficient way from a technology perspective, but also have the greatest impact on the communities where we're you know building, say, a solar field or whatever it might be. That that's you know there's a multitude of um, impacts on the economy, on the people, on the environment, on, you know, if it shuts down a coal plant or it helps build a grid that now is more efficient, you know, that's something where we can, you know, think think ahead. Um, and that's super exciting. But I think the, the other part, which is important for us, and um, and it's the way that I, I think um, I can add something to this, is that we think about what does it mean for real people in real life to show up every day and how are we affecting their mindset when they walk into their workplace and um, our motivation up to this point has been happiness fulfillment satisfaction engagement openness connection that's what we're hoping someone feels when they walk into a we work building what we're now trying to do is later on awareness mindfulness you know um, the feeling that you have choice and that that choice has impact. So if we do something like eliminate plastic use in our buildings, sure, that's great. We have 300,000 people who aren't using a plastic fork. But more importantly, then what is the impact when they go home and they talk to their friends or family or when they order, when they do make that decision to order dinner out, do they check the box that says, you know, I want the green version where they don't where it doesn't come with plastic. You know, it's that, it's that outflow of, of, um, of awareness and mindfulness in each one of those choices. Um, so if you haven't heard already, you know, we made a decision as a company to not um, purchase meat, meat products for our employees, for our events. Um, and um, <laughs> thank you. Um, we didn't, we actually did that not as like, hey, we're gonna make the news with this announcement. It, it wasn't part of our intent. It was actually, let's identify individual personal choices that people make that ladder up to something much bigger and can we, um, and, and create that mindfulness and awareness when you make that choice. So you can be whatever, you can work at WeWork or be a WeWork member and eat whatever you want, but at least you have a layer of awareness when you make that choice and especially if you're spending our money as a company, now you're gonna um, approach that choice with a different um, level of um, you know, appreciation, conflict, confusion, uh-oh, I gotta figure something out now. And especially, imagine you're entertaining a client or a business partner or whatever, and you're paying the bill for that business meeting. Now you gotta explain to that person, hey, <laughs> sorry, if you wanted a steak, it's not gonna go on my credit card, <laughs> you know? And that's, a lot of people are like, how am I gonna have that conversation? But, 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 ima but, it, but if you can do it, imagine how powerful because now you have a forum for a conversation which has ripple effects. And, um, and so that's a lot of what we're trying to do is find those moments where conflict, confusion can result in, in progress. Wow, very impressive, very impressive, Miguel. <laughs> It's that ripple effect, right? How, how do you start at your core business? And I think all of you have spoken about how do you start at the core business, but then ripple the effect out. Ripple the effect out to your supply chain, to your customers, to your users, to schools and universities, and how, how do you ripple out? So that, that is, I think, a very important component of how do you build that exponential curve going up, right? So that it doesn't stay only with you, but you use your app or the competition or the no meat um, to, get, to get beyond your immediate circle. So, Ryan, speaking about disruption, <laughs> uh, Uber bought Jump this year, is that correct? Yeah, in May. In May. Um, so, but both Uber and Jump, if if they were separate companies, which they no longer are, um, have truly been incredibly disruptive uh, in in the transport sector. So, I would love to know from your perspective also the the, the question that I asked um, Miguel because. I think I completely agree with you that it is impossible to know where you are on that exponential curve, but maybe there is something that you feel that like, wow, this could really completely go. Is is that true? Yeah, I think um, what what 
uh, there are technologies that enable this exponential change. So there are new technologies that emerge that then unlock this type of growth. And so for both us and Uber, uh, that was the smartphone and the mass commercialization of it. So you know that period with that first iPhone in 2007, and you start thinking about all the applications that can emerge from that. So uh, I wonder if Lisa's still somewhere back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a, <laughs> a shout out. Um, and so, so for me, I was uh, I have a, a background in urban planning. I was looking at bike share systems in Europe, and I saw the the advent of the smartphone and the uh, advent of IoT and connected devices. And I thought, well, gee, could you put the technology yeah. on a bike? Um, and, and have a much more disruptive, lower cost solution uh, for, for shared bikes. Uh, and obviously around the same time, uh, the founding team at Uber started looking at this and saying, can I just push a button and get a car um, and, and have this magical experience? Um, and what that did is unlock for, for Uber this massive growth over the last uh, eight, nine years where it went from zero to 10 billion trips in a very short amount of time because of this new enabling technology. In, in how much time? Zero to 10 billion trips? Uh, I, I guess that's eight years, right? Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's an, an incredible growth curve. Um, me, on my, on my journey, we were uh, in a, a, a harder path uh, where there wasn't the, the capital applied to, to shared bikes that there was to, to Uber, and, and we didn't have the growth curve. Um, but there was a, a wave of enabling technology that helped us get over the hump, um, which was uh, electric bikes and the technologies associated with that. So the, the batteries getting cheaper, the control systems being more, more available and, and more refined, um, and, the, and building off of the technologies that we wor we've been working on for almost 10 years. Uh, and so when we launched our shared electric product in San Francisco, we saw it just go from nothing to 10 trips per bike per day very quickly. Um, and we started to ride that curve. Um, and then so looking forward, you know, uh, once our product finally clicked and, and, and started taking off, we had lots of options. We could, we could raise more, more, more money. We had M&A opportunities. Um, and I looked around and thought, like, you know, where, where can I make the biggest impact to fulfill our purpose and vision, which is to get people out of single passenger cars uh, and onto light electric vehicles uh, and, and have a major impact on, on, on climate emissions. Um, you know, the transportation of the sector is a very, very significant contributor. Um, and so Uber is at the forefront a lot of, of, on a lot of these technologies and has this global scale um, that allows us to do everything we're doing much faster, uh, much more globally than we would have otherwise. Um, and so, so over the last few months, we've been kind of putting these two pieces together and find tons of alignment and vision. So it's, it's hard sometimes when you're being acquired to know how things are going to fit together. Um, but we really do share the same vision, and we have this huge potential uh, to make a big impact. Um, and so some of the things that, that Uber is working on um, is one is promoting electric vehicles on the platform. There's uh, in 20 cities pilot initiatives on, underway uh, where either there's free charging available or the drivers are getting uh, kind of a subsidy per trip to use an EV. Um, so those, those pilots are underway. Um, we, we have a very advanced express pool product that's getting people into shared vehicles. It's a, a core part of the platform, uh, which is lo lowering the cost for passengers, but getting more people into to one car. Um, and lowering transport emissions. Which has a massive impact. Let's on, remember, on, <laughs> exponentially, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I, absolutely, so getting the, the shared aspect of it is, is critical. Um, you know, everybody owning and driving their own car is what really contributes to this problem. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, it's working on new modes of transportation, uh, electric bikes, electric scooters, and many other things that we're evaluating for what comes next. Um, and that was obvi obviously the rationale for, for them making the acquisition of us um, and scaling that up. And so that for the 50% for the, you know, of trips being less than five miles, uh, for those trips, does it make sense to happen in a two-ton automobile or can you have it happen on an electric bike or electric scooter? It just makes way more sense. Um, and so as much as we can, shifting the mode out of the cars and onto the bikes, and that was the appeal for us. Uh, and so actually, just recently, we, we announced a mode switcher. Uh, so when you're in cities where our product's available, you see on the home screen the ability to, to, to see your bike option, to see your scooter option, soon to see public transit options. And so there's a mode switcher that you as a consumer, you're launching the, you're launching the app to book a car, but then you're presented with these other uh, options that are actually also lower carbon emit, uh, emitting. So 
uh, we're rolling that out. And then to finish on the theme, like what's the next wave enabling technologies that could unlock another exponential mm -hmm. curve? Mm -hmm. And I think the next 10 years in transportation are gonna be even more exciting than the previous. Um, and so when you think of, about automated vehicles, uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, um, they are way more likely- Or autonomous bikes. <laughs> down the road too. <laughs> uh, they're more likely to be shared uh, and electric. Um, and so we have this chance to, to really, one, um, move people out of owning a car and providing a suite of options that allows them to get uh, to where they're going uh, faster, more convenient, um, and more affordably. And two, with automated vehicles, um, you know, they are going to be shared, they are going to be electric, uh, and that gives us uh, the chance to have this exponential impact. So uh, there's a UC Davis study that said a shared electric automated vehicle network could reduce uh, uh, climate emissions by 80%. And so imagine Uber scale, then you apply that to it, and we can start to see that exponential reduction in the transportation category. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> It, it is very exciting what's going to happen in the, uh, in the transport sector. And in fact, I think what you're describing is the switch from seeing transportation as being a good or a product uh, that you own to being a service that you actually pay for um, very specifically. And that actually allows you the, the three revolutions that you've mentioned allows uh, obviously for efficiency, that, uh, efficiency of time and emissions um, that we never had before. Well. I would love to have much more time with you, um, but I think we have to come to a close. So I would like to thank you all and share in your excitement about the next five, 10 years. It's just gonna be incredibly exciting. I actually think that we are incredibly privileged right now, all of us, right? We're incredibly privileged right now because we're alive in the moment of history in which we're seeing more change, more radical change in all sectors than at any other time in human history. And those of you who are actually contributing to that, um, thank you for that, but also congratulations, because you're doing an excellent job at corporate profitability um, and helping the planet at the same time. And all of us are benefited by that. So thank you very much for your contributions today. And we have to get off the stage. Thank you. Please welcome Wells Fargo Renewable Energy and Environmental Finance, Jonathan Privatali. Hello, everyone. I should actually say, hello, world. Could I see a, a quick show of hands? How many people know what that phrase means to a technologist, hello, world? Just a few. Well, let me share with you what that means. I only have three minutes. That is... Yeah, the question is why is Wells Fargo financing the most toxic and polluting fossil fuel extraction in the world? I'd like to talk to you about that afterwards because I have the same question. Yeah, I work in the Renewable Energy and Environmental Finance Group, and we do not finance uh, those types of projects, but it's true, our bank does. Uh, but please, let me, if you, if you would, allow me to share this good news with you. Um, so, hello world. Is, the, uh, is included in the first line of code of a new software language, and that's what I'm gonna talk about today, the orange button. But before I do that, I wanna share some good news with you. Uh, last year, the world uh, installed approximately 150 gigawatts of wind and solar power projects. That is 150 nuclear reactors worth of wind and solar that can fuel approximately 45 million homes. It's incredible. And that is part of approximately 950 gigawatts that have been installed. We're talking about 950 nuclear reactors of wind and solar out there. This is a big deal. Um, Wells Fargo has a $200 billion commitment to finance renewable energy projects and also other green projects by 2030. We've already financed $30 billion worth of projects. My group alone, which is just 30 people, has financed 
uh, financed $3 billion worth of wind and solar projects last year, equivalent to about 10% of all the wind and solar that's generated in the United States each year. So it's a substantial thing. Thank you. But I'm not here to talk about the, uh, I'm not here to talk about the, uh, here we go. Uh, I'm not talk here to talk about uh, those achievements. I'm here to talk about the orange button. The orange button is a new data standard that we have contributed over a thousand unique terms and, uh, and definitions to. Uh, it's, a, it's a language that we are co-developing with many other organizations, over 300 other organizations, and funded by the Department of Energy to streamline the interoperability of businesses and people who are all working together to develop wind, solar projects, and also green bonds. Um, this cartoon here shows all the different organizations that have to work together in order to develop just one single wind power or solar power project. And in theory, uh, they're all communicating very well together and whatnot, but in all actuality, uh, the communication is severed because they use different terms. The people use different terms. The computers use, the business system use, use different terms. And uh, a couple years ago, uh, we joined with the Department of Energy to create a new taxonomy, a new language, a new dictionary of terms that is now uh, over 4,000 unique terms and definitions so we can streamline the communication between these organizations. We are supporting this initiative as an innovative financial technology in order to scale green bonds, uh, scale wind and solar power projects. And we ask you to join us. Uh, we cannot be the only bank that uses this. We cannot be the only organization that uses this. Our customers need to use it. Their customers need to use it for it all to work together. So please find out more about it. Adopt it. For the heads of state here and the heads of, of cities, uh, please incentivize the use of the Orange Button Initiative in order to streamline communication uh, with between uh, people in the solar and wind power industry and, and green bonds, and also promote it. There's a great guide online called the Orange Button Taxonomy Guide. You can search for it, you can find it, and you can share it with your, your project managers, your software developers, your product managers, your CTOs, and uh, that will help them spread the word and adopt this free uh, new standard. Thank you very much. Please welcome the head of digital industry for Bloomberg New Energy Finance, Claire Curry. Hi. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for sticking around. This is Datum. He is a small data piece within a bigger data set that could transform your business. It could help you reduce your CO2 emissions, improve your efficiency, and make you optimized. However, Datum sits in a whole bunch of data that is not helpful for your business. It's false or missing, it's interoperable, and generally you cannot get at that very useful data. Well, digital technologies are here to help. Things like advanced sensors, new networks, machine learning, analytics, edge computing, they can all transform your data into structured data set full of happy data. And this is all the blue ones. The pink ones are ones you didn't even know you needed or didn't know existed before you used these technologies. Now, why is this important for climate change? Well, climate change and us tackling it is all about optimization. Optimizing our manufacturing processes, the way we make things, the way we use things and reuse things. And optimization needs analy analytics, which needs data. Bloomberg is a company dedicated to helping its customers um, with valuable and transparent data. Bloomberg has a big portfolio of um, sustainable business and finance data, including a world-leading ESG database. That means we have over 800 fields of information on 11,000 public companies around environmental, sustainable, um, social, and governance data. I work at a unit of Bloomberg called Bloomberg NEF. We are the primary research service at Bloomberg, and I lead a team writing about industry digitalization. We write about 
um, clean energy, advanced transportation, digital industry, um, innovative materials and commodities. Bloomberg is also very involved in external climate initiatives. We are a signatory on the Mission 2020 um, Step Up Declaration, and Michael Bloomberg also chairs the TCFD. The TCFD um, has provided last June in 2017 a series of voluntary recommendations that companies can sign up to to provide um, publicly the risks that their business have and the opportunities they have around climate and climate change. Since last year, 425 companies have um, signed up to, be, to support this declaration. What I want to talk to you now for the next couple of minutes is about some of the work my team has been doing quantifying the benefits of digital tech in climate. Our most famous piece of research probably at BNEF is our forecast of where energy is going in the next 30 years. You can see here we think it's pretty much clean and cheap. We're looking at large amounts of solar, large amounts of wind reducing amounts of fossil fuels. But with that comes a problem around reliability. Renewables are intermittent, and so what do we do? How do we make sure the lights stay on for everyone, even when the sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing? I believe digital technologies can, um, can really tackle that, and the way that they're doing that is a number, of, a number of things I'm going to show you. First up, there is a real problem with baseload power plants right now. They are aging, they are failing, um, and they are going to have to become increasingly flexible in a way that they don't have to be right now. They're going to have to integrate them better with renewables. Digital tech, sensors and analytics, things like asset performance management and machine learning can help us understand how those fossil fuel plants are really working and how they could integrate renewables better. Our analysis shows that with basic IoT, so asset performance management, we can reduce the cost of renewables and baseload power. Both reducing baseload power is important for our power costs, but also doing that enables it to be more flexible, ramping, peakier, and it helps them really integrate more solar and more wind to get up to these big declarations that the Californian government and others are setting. It's also really interesting for the energy demand side of things. Air conditioning and data centers, to name two new load centers, are ramping significantly. This means we really have to get a grip on how we're generate, how we're using energy. Machine learning can optimize data center energy use, as Google is doing, um, and sensors can also track our energy use. We are forecasting $340 billion to be spent on smart meters between 2010 and 2030. That means in 2030, there'll be 2 billion smart meters. These are in kind of clever sensors in the home that can help control our energy use, turn down our thermostat, and also help utilities know exactly where energy is being used. What about other CO2 emissions? Well, it is not just electricity we have to worry about. There is methane leakage across all of the US coal mines and gas and oil pipelines. Um, you can see here that we don't even know how much there really is leaking, but of the stuff we think we know about, about a third of that could get actually recovered at a profit. And drones have the potential answer to this. There are autonomous drones in deployment now, in development um, being used by NASA to help scan pipelines and be able to sniff out methane a thousand times greater sensitivity than normal methods. This means we could collect at a profit 95 million metric tons of CO2 every year in the US alone. And finally, what about manufacturing? Manufacturing and the supply chain and transportation of that manufactured goods are incredibly energy intensive and CO2 emission intensive. You can see here steel alone, just making steel, produces 8.5 billion tons of CO2 a year globally. 3D printing is a new technology that is commercializing now that has the real potential here to optimize everything around manufacturing. I mean, even at the basic level, 3D printing only uses the materials it needs to make objects, unlike normal manufacturing that has a lot of waste. It also can make durable products out of plastics and polymers, meaning that it can reduce the amount of steel we use. And as you can see here, steel is incredibly energy intense compared to plastics. In fact, our analysis shows that you can actually produce a piece of industrial equipment at 47% of the cost using 3D printers. And CO2 emissions there will kind of fall in accordance with that cost. You can see here things like local manufacturing reduces transit, but also things around preparation time reduces. And you no longer need warehousing because 3D printing enables you to do just-in-time manufacturing on site. 
Hopefully that's given you an idea about the work that Bloomberg's doing and my team at BNF is doing to help our clients um, with valuable and transparent data to show them how digital tech can really help transform our planet. Thank you very much. Please welcome the co-founder, president, and chief technology officer at Zooks, Dr. Jesse Levinson. Good afternoon. It's uh, great to be here today uh, at the Global Climate Action Summit. I'd like to thank Governor Brown, Mayor Bloomberg, and the other co-chairs for bringing us together here in San Francisco. It's also good to see some hecklers in the audience who are disrupting, disrupting climate disruption. That's, that's good. We don't, we don't have enough disruption already in Silicon Valley. Um, my name is Jesse Levinson, and I grew up right down the road. I started developing technologies for autonomous vehicles 13 years ago at Stanford. And today, I am the chief technology officer of Zooks, a company I co-founded four years ago. For those of you who don't know about Zooks, we are building a fully autonomous, battery electric, bi-directional, and symmetrical vehicle. And we're also creating the AI stack to make it drive itself and the infrastructure needed to operate at scale in cities. We're not doing this because it's easy. Trust me, it isn't. Uh, let's take a step back and look at where we've come from. Just as the internal combustion engine took us out of the age of the horse and carriage and into the age of the automobile, we believe AI and robotics will take us out of the age of the automobile and into what comes next, the autonomous vehicle. Autonomous mobility is not just an incremental change when done completely. It's a revolutionary departure from the age of the car. Now, today we're used to a model of individually owned, gas-powered, human-driven vehicles. That model is broken. We believe the full realization of autonomous mobility requires three elements. So at Zooks, we're designing a new vehicle from the ground up that is optimized for electric mobility, shared fleet, and full autonomy. So we're going to talk about those three things and why they're important. So first up, 100% electric. Now, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has already pretty bought into the notion of zero emission electric mobility. Uh, but just in case, I will remind you that every year, roughly 7 million premature deaths are linked to air pollution, and that actually a quarter of air pollution in the US is caused from transportation. So this is a really huge problem. Again, I think everybody here kind of realizes that. Um, but let's take a look at well-to-wheel greenhouse gas emissions of cars. So the first bar shows us what we get from an internal combustion engine car. That's not very good. If we switch to a hybrid like the Prius, we can cut that in half. That's a good improvement. If we switch to a fully electric vehicle that's powered from the California electric grid, we cut that by another factor of two. Big improvement again. But if we can get to powering our vehicles with 100% renewables, we get another order of magnitude improvement, even beyond that. So it's pretty clear that we need to do this. So would it be enough for everybody to go out and buy themselves an electric car? Well, no. Uh, in fact, in the US, we own way too many cars and then leave them sitting around doing nothing. Uh, turns out cars are used 4% of the time, and 96% of the time, they're just taking up space and depreciating. When you're not using your car, nobody else is. And believe it or not, making a conventional car, even an electric one, creates about as much carbon pollution as driving a car over its entire useful life. Not only that, but most vehicle miles traveled in the US involve only a single occupant. Not very good. Now, making cars that do nothing 96% of the time is not only bad for the environment, it's also bad business. Instead of more than two cars per family, which is how many we own in the US today, we will be able to meet cities' transportation needs with far fewer vehicles. And Zook's vehicles are designed for sharing. So when you're not using them, somebody else is. It's a much better use of resources. And we're not wasting valuable space in cities by taking up more parking places, and we're not contributing to the one-third of traffic that's just caused by people looking for parking places. Right? Also, right here in the Bay Area, sitting in traffic costs commuters about 80 hours every year. That's equivalent to a two-week vacation every single year, just sitting in traffic. So at Zooks, our vehicles will have a battery that's really, really big. In fact, it's so big, we can drive customers before the sun comes up to after they go to bed, which is probably over 100 vehicles per 
100 passengers per vehicle per day without having to recharge. Our battery is actually much bigger than any battery in the world today on any car. And that's not just a nice to have feature, it actually solves really important challenges. In particular, it means we aren't going to have to charge our vehicles in the middle of the day, which means we don't have to waste time and energy and miles driving to and from our customers and our charging stations. It also means we only have to charge our vehicles at night, and that's really good because demand for rides and energy is way lower in the middle of the night. Okay, so we've talked about electric vehicles and we've talked about sharing. So maybe the thing to do is just everybody can use Uber and Lyft and all the Uber and Lyft drivers can buy electric cars. Well, does that solve our problem? Well, no, still not, right? And it turns out that if you wanted to sell your car and just use Uber and Lyft for point-to-point -point mobility, for example, in the Bay Area, it would cost you about $20,000 a year, which is about twice as expensive as owning your own car. Now, I don't think it's very surprising that most people can't afford to pay somebody else to drive them around all the time. That's a little bit extravagant. So the only way to really solve this problem at scale is to create fully autonomous vehicles. And by the way, there's one other really important reason why we have to do that, which is that in the US, almost 40,000 people lose their lives every year in car crashes. And globally, that figure is more than 1.2 million. Almost all of these crashes are caused by human error. So we, as a society, should not continue to accept that. Now, thanks to our business model, which allows us to amortize not only the environmental impact, but also the hardware cost of our vehicles by driving people around all day long and having them pay for the service, we can actually afford to use the most advanced sensors and computers to solve autonomy robustly. So we're using 360 degree cameras, radars, and lidars, and then we're developing machine learning and AI techniques that take that sensor data and translate that into responsive and safe driving. Today, Zoox already has a fleet of test vehicles driving over the Bay Area with our AI software and sensors. We're driving autonomously during the day, at night, in fog, and in the rain, and this is really state-of-the-art work that's happening right here in the Bay Area at Zoox. We're handling super complicated situations. You can see a lot of them on the screen now, right? Heavy rain, pedestrian detection at night, four-way intersections, tunnels, freeways. Here we're doing an unprotected left turn with oncoming vehicles at a six-way intersection. This is really, really hard. I don't like driving here, but our vehicles are, are pretty amazing at it. So uh, as you can see, we are developing, testing, and validating this technology, and it's getting better every single day. We're a team of 550 software engineers, hardware engineers, safety experts, designers, and makers working together to create a safer and sustainable mobility ecosystem. Not only is this gonna be good for the environment and economically sound, it's going to be a really new and exciting experience. So this is, this is really hard work. Uh, there's still more to do, but we believe it's the best way to harness this technology for society, and uh, we think it's really worth doing. So thank you, and feel free to come by our booth across the street next uh, tomorrow. Thank you. So friends, welcome to the revolution in the transportation sector. Welcome to the revolution in the finance sector. Welcome to a world where drones smell out methane. How exciting is that? The future is actually today. It is being co-created. We're doing it intentionally. It is going to be tremendously exciting and tremendously clean. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Beautiful. That was exactly what we were looking for. Can I go back? Yes, you can.